gentlemen, we're here at HR Tech 2022, Las Vegas. You all just finished your session. John Boudreau, Greg Pryor, great seeing you. Outstanding to listen, learn, and explore with you two. So if you would, just share a little bit, a little bit about what you spoke about today. John? Well, I think uh, Greg and I get, managed to get together around a topic. You know, I've been working on uh, work kind of melting and being more fluid and, and reconfiguring. And Greg and I got to talking about how important social agility is going to be and how that's kind of a lubricator for all this uncertainty and all this remaking and all that stuff. And so we uh, put all that together and it turned out to be a pretty good talk. Yeah, no, it was there, I mean, it was, first of all, it's obviously, it's great to see people in person. It's great to see John in person. I've yeah. seen him in a, in a little Zoom box for, for two caveat. long. You're yes, the only yeah. one that thinks We're all that. fired up now, but <laughs> yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think, Al, as you know, as the world has become increasingly still so uncertain. And, you know, what I have always appreciated about knowing John is that view looking forward. And I think I'll, I'll steal one of the headlines that sure. he talked about and sort of thinking about that futurist surfing, right? Yeah. We have to surf the waves that we are that we get. We have to be out there and, and start paddling when one is paddling and keep our eyes open. And, and I think that's what the future is going to look like increasingly for us. And so we offered some possible future states, some things that we think could be drivers in the future, the democratization of work, uh, Work without jobs, obviously one of those things. And then as John mentioned, you know, social agility for me and I was starting to think about that and the importance of that being a lubricant in a world without jobs where people are coming together. You need to have, I think, that social cohesion to quickly connect with people, feel a sense of trust, be productive. So we, we geeked on geeked out on that for about an hour. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you, yeah, you, you did. did. Exactly. And I, and I was there geeking Thanks with you. Thanks for coming, Al. Yeah, no, it's my pleasure. <laughs> Yeah, I want to get to this point on this lubrication in a second because it's really, I think, important tension that we have to address both organizationally and individually, if I understood you correctly, because we're in this world of perpetual change, as you noted. But you started off that talk with HR trajectory and then the work needs just getting more distant from HR's progression. So some HR leaders, workers, it becomes overwhelming, and thus esoteric, thus they're dismissive. It's just like, it's just going to work itself out, I'm just going to put my head down and, and go. So my pointed question to you, if you're an HR or advising an HR leader, how do you address that complexity? You know, it, sometimes it's overwhelming, but you know, to get those gears lubricated properly, you've got to embrace the complexity, at least in my view. John, yeah. what, what do you think about that? I, I, I think there's probably two things, Al, that, that I go to when confronted with that. And it is daunting, and even if you feel like you've got a handle on it as an HR leader or CHRO, the people that are your clients may not. I mean, and they may be quite overwhelmed. You know, leaders and others just wanting to please snap back, and can I please manage the way I used to? So for me, it's maybe two things. One is, uh, Robin and I are fond of a quote from William Gibson that the future is unevenly distributed. So that means that there are going to be perhaps large swaths of your organization that don't have to be bleeding edge. And everybody doesn't have to be on this roller coaster, at least not yet. So you can pick your spots, pick where there's energy. Um, and then the other one is the idea of getting more rigorous about experimenting. So instead of, we don't know, meaning, well, we're going to have chaos and you know, everybody's going to try everything, which I think is often the way it looks. You know, I think what I encourage folks to do is step back and say, what are the tools of experimentation that have worked before in areas of uncertainty like software, products, et cetera? Could we be more rigorous, more systematic, and give people a sense that there is a, a system here? Even if we can't predict the future, we have a way of dealing with uncertainty and harnessing it rather than just being victims. I, I, I could hug you for saying that today. It just, you, know, you, you put a framework around something, and you know, I learned this from you damn near 20 years ago with the LAMP model. It's like, you know, now it becomes more understandable. You, know, yeah. you, can, you can put it in a place where you can be addressed and or parked you know, for later. Right. So, you know, we can't rehash the whole session you know, right now, but there are a couple of highlights. You, you talk about earning the commute, which you know, I, I love. I love that. It was also the case, you know, and then it invited the question, well, if you are going to go into the workplace, for what purpose? And I, that really resonated, not only with me, but based on the questions of the audience. So you want to talk about earning the commute and why people can and should be coming together? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that always really strikes me, and Al, you and I have talked about this, is I, I think it's so 
obscure and, and basically sort of out of touch with the with the wh how we're talking about returning to office. There are such tremendous opportunities to frame what we know is really important to people is career well-being. And when we look at Rob's recent research and the stuff that Michael, you know, the research that Michael Arena is doing, to frame the opportunity to return to the office to meet two fundamental needs, the need that we all have to connect, to be inspired by others, to have the energy that we have here at this conference, that is one very important reason. The second is this idea of career well-being. And we know that uh, a reason to come back together is to get feedback, to get a sense of purpose uh, for the larger organization, uh, to learn and develop together. We know that uh, culture, through Michael's great work and, and, and Rob's writing as well, that culture is contagious. And so we look to others as, as much caught as it is taught. And so there are very specific reasons that are in, I believe, the best interest of the individual and the organization by design. And there are also lots of other reasons to, when you're working heads down, as Michael would say, uh, that you should be, you should, you could work from anywhere. You're better off without those distractions. So I think the future is really going to be more intentional to fit the type of work you're doing where you do that work. And I think we'll see, again, a, obviously a super fan of Michael Arena's work on adaptive space, uh, thinking about the intentionality of when am I doing discovery, when am I doing development, and when am I doing diffusion. When I'm doing discovery and diffusion, I need to be heads up. I want to be inspired by others. I want to get feedback. When I'm doing development, let me do development. Let me be heads down. Let me not get distracted. So I actually think we're on the beginning of a whole new way to think about work, when we come together, why we come together, and what the benefits are to both the individual and the organization. And I think if we frame it that way, it will make sense to people. I think well, the current and arguments. The, and I think have the courage to act on it. So to, to really be willing to say, whenever you're doing, uh, let's say, development, you know, when, it, when that's happening, you need to be, you need to be, um, you need to be head down. You know, and to have leaders have the framework and also the leeway uh, to, to negotiate with their people and have honest discussions. You know, a framework makes it discussable. A framework allows someone to say, oh, we're going to use those three buckets, great. Then when I talk to you about where I want to be, I have a word that you'll understand, and we can talk about it. You know, somebody says, "Well, I don't think so. I think you're doing diffusion." You know, and, and but at now at least we can have that instead of I just think people work better in the office. Right, you know, right, I mean, it's right. just so right. counterproductive. Yeah. You know, yeah. or better and, out, and or, within that or nobody having, ever has to come right, to work yeah. again. Yeah. You know, it's the same. You know, I'm not about either extreme. Neither one of them offers much insight. You know, one of the things that, and I, you know, just a couple more minutes here, and because I do have two more questions about that, but one comment first, because I was really taken by Adam Grant's book, Think Again, and Think Like a Scientist, and that implies in our profession that we have to remain in incessant curiosity about the needs of the workforce and the disruptions that are happening. In other words, what we've learned over our 20, 30 year career might not be appropriate for the reality of today. We have to be curious about the reality today and adjust accordingly. And I see many post-pandemic, and I know we're not really post-pandemic, falling into old ways of being, you know, things that they're comfortable with as opposed to what's appropriate, particularly for younger workers who have different wants and needs than when we grew up. So, your comments about the need to unlearn and be more open-minded to new ways of doing things. Do you see HR doing that? Do you see leadership teams embracing this change or is it still too daunting right now? I mean, I I would say I see some, Al. Yeah. I think, and I think this, I think we'll look back at this time and this is what will create what I, what I think in my mind as the COVID chasm. Mm -hmm. There are those people post COVID who had the capabilities, who were thinking like scientists, who were doing the experimenting, who were, who were listening to John and reading his books, they will move forward aggressively. And then there will be those who will look back and embrace the old ways of work, which I just, I, it's hard to imagine, given all the things that we know are happening in the new world of work, they're, they're just not going to be relevant. And I think there will be this growing and quickly dividing chasm between those folks who are thinking about the next world of work and those who are going back to the old world of work and I sort of have a sense of how that story may end, and I think most people uh, do as well. Well, yeah, I have one more question, then we'll give you some uh, chances to uh, ask or share with our audience you know, how they can learn more about what you two are doing. It's this, is that 
we're at HR Tech. I mean, there's a lot of money that's been going into this this industry. This is impacting the lives of millions upon millions of people, not only here in the United States, but around the world. And I'm thinking about my kids and young people or those in career transition and how it's going to impact them. So particularly for young people, what would you advise? You know, what would you encourage as they develop themselves? And I know in your book, you know, we're designed we're kind of a work of without jobs. <laughs> it is it, it's the case where we have to be, again, more creative on how we develop ourselves. It's not all about getting the degree. And what's the language that you use in the old way of looking oh, at Oh, let the degrees melt into qualifications. Right. And, yeah, right. like a part of a degree so counts. The, the key question there, like for young people in particular, what, what should they be thinking about? Should they be more open-minded around how they develop their career? What's your coaching them? Well, yeah, I, I think, you know, when I get that question, and I get it a lot from parents, I think the first word that comes to mind for me is to be agile. Uh, and, and again, to sort of understand that I don't know doesn't necessarily mean paralysis. And in fact, it can be a real opener and to, uh, I think, break it into small parts. So you don't have to think 20 years ahead and, and that doesn't mean to be agile to 20 years of different possibilities, but it means maybe be agile to the next year or two and, and look for organizations and relationships that are even if you don't know what the openness will lead to, that are open to change. Uh, and so if you hear, this is your path for five years even, you know, you probably want a little red flag going off to say, I'm not sure I can believe that they, they really can know that five years. So, so, you know, talk to me about what if that doesn't happen, that kind of thing. So, I mean, I'm a, I'm a fan of, of our friend Bob Johansson at the Institute for the Future and, and Bob's book, The New Leadership Literacies. And he talks about one of those leadership literacies being taking a, a sort of gameful mindset. And we talked a little bit about this in the session. I do think, not that, not that, not a, not a not serious, but a game. I think that the new world of work will look like collecting these experiences, mm -hmm. having experiences where you build capabilities and connections. Yeah. And you literally put them in your backpack and you acquire them as superpowers that you then use when you get that new experience that challenges you and say, I'm going to pull this capability out. Or I'm going to call John Boudreau because he's one of my connections and I need his help yeah. on this. And so I do think that the world will look like, as John talked about in the book, it will be these series of work projects and then you will use those to build capabilities that you will then use in a, in a broader context. So I think, again, it's going to look a little bit more like, like the games that we play and we just continue to level up. We, we collect these superpowers that we can then leverage when we need them. And I, I think, I think uh, uh, you know, Bob got it right when he talked about that gameful mindset toward, toward work. And, and I'm going to go out and I'm going to do those experiences. I'm going to learn, I'm going to grow, I'm going to build capabilities and connections. And I love your analogy, Greg, in the talk about, you know, the, let's say the older person saying, when do I win this game? And the younger person was at you, you know, saying, you don't win, you just level up. You know, and I think it's kind of like, if you're thinking of a hundred year life, then it's a life of leveling up and moving here and moving there and um, hopefully, you know, hopefully HR Tech will, will create the systems that make that a lot easier, a lot more straightforward, a lot less daunting. Young people will be less confronted with, we don't do that here, I don't recognize what you're talking about, and much more, yeah, of course, we get it. You know, that's what we're here for. And I, I would just add, and I know we're running out of time, Al, but I think what's critical to that, as John talked about and, and we talked about, is that the viscosity, the, the, the oil in that system that allows that to operate is this idea of social agility. That if I'm going to move from project to project and we get a really thoughtful question from the audience, to be like, hey, how do we manage this disruption? We have to accelerate people's ability to build trust, to make connections, and so I do think there's a new capability that needs to get built as we look at this career oscillation, these experiences, and you know that's some of the work that we've been doing, you know, with Michael and Rob, is really building out those capabilities to help people accelerate and 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 uh, and move on to projects more successfully, feel a greater sense of success and satisfaction. Yeah, I I so celebrate that. I'm going to take this last few minutes and send it to my kids immediately <laughs> because it, you know they have this mindset of that they look at their parents, me in this case. Oh, you went to college, you got this degree, and you know they're 
either consciously or subconsciously following that path. I'm like, time out. You know, the world is different. Celebrate that the world is different. You don't have to go on, on that path, particularly with COVID, as that massive disruption, we're all trying to process it. So anyway, gentlemen, thank you for doing what you do. You've been an inspiration for me for the past 20 years. Greg, not quite 20 years. Not quite 20 years at all. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. That's so nice of you to say it. <laughs> no, it's true. Absolutely. So how can people learn more about you and what you're up to? Well, we talked about the new book with my good colleague, Robin J. Suthausen, Work Without Jobs. So go to the website. And then I am uh, remain affiliated and doing work with the Center for Effective Organizations at USC. So uh, take a look there about some of the research and other projects we're working on. Yeah, and I'd say two things. I mean, go to connectedcommons.com. Uh, plenty of research that we've all been doing there. And then if particularly you're part of a new role, I'm going to make a plug for our Harvard Business Review article that David Sylvester, uh, Rob Cross, and I wrote that was in the December uh, cover story of the Harvard Business Review on how to uh, accelerate when you're in a new role at work. And so if you are in a new role, if you're doing those career things, I'd encourage you to read the article to get some insights into how to more quickly get pulled into the network rather than try to push yourself into the All network. Right, well, we'll make sure to put that in the link. And I want to thank Workday for having us in their booth and letting us do this, as well as HR Tech. You know, it's been an amazing event. And, uh, if you're not uh, here this year, come next year. A quick thank you to what must be two, 3,000 people uh, oh, yeah. here listening to this right here on the floor. I mean, just thank you all. It's, as far as the eye can see, it's amazing. All right, gentlemen, be well, appreciate you. Thanks, Al, thanks so much.